Welcome to Teaching the Truth with Pastor Eric C. Bogan. Clearly define what I am to do. Let every word penetrate the heart. Let what is said lead them running to your arms. Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. So uh, open your playbook to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 48. Jeremiah 48. I want to continue in um, our discussion that we began last week uh, that we entitled The Undisturbed, The Undisturbed, and um, our message today again is taken from Jeremiah 48, excuse me, Jeremiah 48 and verse 11. And it reads, Moab hath been at ease from his youth, and he has settled on his lease. He has settled on his lease and hath not been emptied from vessel to vessel, neither hath he gone into captivity. Therefore, the Lord says, his taste remains in him and his scent is not changed. His scent is not changed. I want to read it for you out of the New American Standard Version or Bible. Verse 11 reads this way, Moab has been at ease since his youth. He has also been undisturbed. He has been undisturbed like wine on its dregs. He has not been emptied from vessel to vessel, nor has he gone into exile. Therefore, he retains his flavor and his aroma has not changed. His aroma has not changed. He has not been emptied. He's undisturbed. And this is where we get the title of our message, The Undisturbed. This is a prophecy directed against Moab. But it's more than that. I said it's more than that. I believe this can also be viewed as a warning and as a reminder to us today. And what is that reminder? The reminder is this, there's a danger of going through life undisturbed. There is a danger of going through life undisturbed. Jeremiah uses this phrase, undisturbed. In the King James Version, it it says, settled on its lease. And what he's saying here, he's using this in the sense of Moab going through its existence as a nation without ever having to experience any trouble or captivity. And Jeremiah, uh, through through the Spirit of God, is prophesying and comparing Moab to wine that is undisturbed. Again, most of us here are not uh, uh, winemakers. Some of you may be wine connoisseurs, but that's another discussion. But most of us are not wine makers, and so many of us, we miss what's being said here. But in the process of making wine, what tends to happen is lease, that's what it says in your Bible, lease, L-E-E-S, or dregs, or sediment, begins to build up at the bottom where wine is stored. When you're making wine, as it begins to ferment, one of the things that happens is sediment left over from the fermentation begins to build up at the bottom 
of the container where wine is stored. Kind of like when we used to, you know, make punch or Kool-Aid and put different stuff in it. And, and how many know sometimes that stuff kind of settles at the bottom? That's the sediment. That's the leftover. That's the lease. And what happens is when this is allowed to remain at the bottom of wine, it jeopardizes the wine's taste, begins to affect it in a negative way. And so when you're making wine, one of the things you want to do is you want to remove that sediment as it builds up from the wine. And the way you do that is by emptying the wine from one vessel into another. That's how you separate it. And Jeremiah is using this metaphor to explain how many times we allow the things that's left over from our old life. I mean, you know, there's some things left over from your old life, some, some attitude that's left over from your old life, some lust that's left over, mentalities left over. And if you let that stay in there, it starts affecting how we taste. Amen. And so one way to resolve that or refine the wine, we have to be poured out, displaced. God's got to put us in a new situation, an uncomfortable situation, take us out of our comfort zone. And this trials, that's what we call them, that we often go through, even though it's uncomfortable for us, it's refining us. And this is what Jeremiah is talking about. And this is why we're saying he's speaking not just to Moab. This is a principle that we need to be reminded of. That the reason why many of us are going through trials and temptations and things, this is God trying to refine us because he's trying to separate us from some lease or some things that have been settled in there from the old life. We don't notice it. It's down deep. But how many know when you get poured into a trial, that's when you begin to see it. That's when it gets revealed. Amen. Now, um, we, we, we didn't go into a lot of detail as to what God was trying to separate from Moab by bringing them into captivity. What was this sentiment? I know we're, we're speaking of it in a general term. We're speaking of it in general. But what is the sediment that God was trying to separate from Moab? What was he trying to uh, uh, sanctify this nation of? Well, I want to deal with that today. And what we notice is found in verse 7. So Jeremiah 48 Jeremiah 48 and verse 7, Jeremiah 48 and verse 7, it says, For because, for because thou hast trusted in thy works and in thy treasures, thou shalt also be taken. And Chemosh, and Chemosh shall go forth into captivity with his priests and his princes together. Again, verse 7 reveals to us what this sediment is that he's trying to separate Moab from. He says, because thou hast trusted, notice, in your works and in your treasure. So the reason God was sending Moab into captivity was because they trusted in themselves. Do you hear me, church? Many times the reason why we're going into situations and trials is because God is trying to reveal to us how we trust in ourselves. And he says more specifically, you're trusting in yourselves by A, trusting in your treasures. Yeah. This is why we like to, you know, stack them bands. We like to Put that money up, have it there, and we just feel better when it's there because what? We trust that we can handle any situation when we got the money in the bank. 
This is why many times we, 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 are, we are trying to work this and do that and have all of this going on because we're trying to build up our faith in our riches. Hmm? And then he says, another way we trust in ourselves, or Moab was trusting by trusting in their works. More specifically, trusting in the works of their hands, which he identifies as chemosh. C-H-E-M-O-S-H. And chemosh was their god, their idol. Chemosh was the false god of the Moabites, the idol. How many know you make idols with your hands? See, it's the work of your hands. And so they made this idol that they call Chemosh, and this idol became something that they also trusted in. And so God says, I'm going to bring you into captivity because you have placed more trust in your riches and in your idols than you have in me, in me. And so to refine Moab, to separate them from that error, because how many know the church has lost their taste because we got more trust in our riches and in our works, our idols, either our ability to save ourselves or what we've created to save ourselves, right? And now the church had a different, you know, years ago when we didn't have no money, when before we made or invented anything, how many know the church had a different flavor? Did it not? It had a different reputation in the world. And for the most part, the, the world, ha, I mean, the church has, has pretty much lost that. Oh, but God's about to cause us to regain it. Because he's, he's bringing us, like he brought Moab, into trials where our money nor our inventions are going to be able to save us. And you know what the interesting thing is? Uh, God told, is saying here to Moab that not only am I bringing you into this trial, I'm going to bring your God in there too. Look, back at verse 7, Jeremiah 48 and 7. Jeremiah 48 and verse 7. For because you have trusted in your works and in your treasures, thou shall be taken, that is go into captivity. Somebody say and. Chemosh shall go forth into captivity with his priests and his princes together. So he's going to bring their idol in there too. Why? Because he's going to prove that not only they are helpless to save themselves, but their gods are helpless to save them as well. And that the only one they'll be able to trust the only one they'll be able to count on is the Lord. You know, that's why he brought judgments in Egypt. You know, he brought judgment on the Nile because they put so much confidence in the Nile. Man, they built the whole, they built, Egypt was, was built all around the Nile because the Nile was how they brought water into the desert. I mean, this is it. Oh, it turned it to blood. He brought judgment on everything the Egyptians trusted in and Israel, you know, also trusted in. He brought judgment against all of it to prove that I'm the top. I'm the best. And nobody can save you but me. But we got to learn that. You understand? Somebody say, I got it. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to share with you a dream that I recently received a couple of days ago. Some of you are new to us. One of the things that that happens here quite frequently at our church, that when God wants to put an exclamation point on a particular message or lesson, he will many times cause different ones in here to have a dream. 
And that dream is given to me, and the Lord by his spirit gives us the interpretation and understand. Say, I'm listening. I'm listening. When God sends these dreams, it's because he wants to bring attention to the lesson. Because many times we come in here and we go back out and it's, we treat these sermons like, oh, it's just another sermon. So God's, gonna try, God's trying to get our attention and say, hey, this is important right here. So like if you've been sleeping, if you hadn't paid attention before, pay attention right here because this is me talking to this congregation. And what he's saying is people in this room People who are watching need to hear this because this is your issue. I'm dealing with you all in this space right here. And there are people in this room today either going in, either in a trial or about to go in one or just coming out of one and God is going to educate us as to why he sent that trial so that we'll stop trusting in ourselves and in the works of our hands. Do you understand this? And so I'm calling this dream freedom fighters. Freedom fighters. And you'll see in just a minute why. Here we go. It's not a very long dream at all. It says, in this dream, I observed someone being treated wrongly. Treated wrongly. And it upset me. And I told the person, why don't you leave them alone? And the person said to me, why? I answered, because what you're doing is wrong. Then the person turned to me and said, oh, so you're a freedom fighter. Why don't you just rest? Oh, you're a freedom fighter. Why don't you just rest? So you can see why I'm calling this the freedom fighter. This person is observing uh, an individual being mistreated by another person. And it bothered them. I said, hey, why don't you leave him alone? Why, why should I leave him alone? Because what you're doing is wrong. And he says, oh, I see. I see who you are. You're a freedom fighter. And what, what's the advice to that person? Why don't you just rest? So the person who, was, who received this dream is accused of being a freedom fighter. What's a freedom fighter? I never thought about that. We use that term sometimes. A freedom fighter is an individual who takes matters in their own hands in order to right a wrong or change the conditions around them. A freedom fighter is someone who takes matters into their own hands in order to right a wrong or to change the conditions around them. Now, one of the main reasons why freedom fighters take matters into their own hands is because they don't trust the authorities to handle it. Do you understand me? I said the reason why freedom fighters take matters into their own hands is because they've lost faith in the authority to handle it. So they say, I'm going to handle it myself. So your freedom fighter, if you're trying to fix your own problems, your freedom fighter if you're trying to fix other people's problems without the help of the authorities, in this case, God. Amen. You're a freedom fighter if you've lost faith in God and you're trying to fix your own problems or fix the problems that are around you. We, we listen to people all the time. They say, oh, you, if it, it, look, you're going to have to fix that. Well, Why? you got to fix that because really what they're saying is if you don't fix it, it won't get fixed. You ever been in a trial and you feel like, i gotta, I got to fix this? No. I'm going to let God fix it. Amen, somebody. Amen. I said amen, somebody. 
letting God fix it. Now, sometimes uh, uh, letting God fix it is saying that, I know we said this before earlier today as we were, you know, before we uh, began our message today, we talked about speaking to our mountain. People say, well, well that's, that's, that's like a contradiction. No, it's not. I'm going to speak to it, but I ain't going to move it. I'm going to speak to it because I trust God's going to move it. Can you see the difference? I said, do you understand the difference? See, when you're trusting God, it means that you're operating in the rest. That's what it meant when the man, when the person told this person who had the dream, why don't you just rest? That was an invitation to trust God. The Bible uh, describes uh, uh, faith or being in faith as being in a posture of rest. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. And the reason why I'm having you go here, because it's interesting how the Bible expects us to respond to wrongful treatment, right? You know, in a dream, the person observed um, someone else being treated wrongly, being treated wrongly, receiving something they don't deserve. How does the Bible expect us to respond to wrongful treatment, right? How many times did that happen when we got into trial and says, oh, I didn't deserve this. <laughs> this ain't fair, Lord. Why you let this happen? Right? Notice what the Bible says, how we should respond to such situations. First Peter chapter 2, verse 19. For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience towards God, endure grief and suffering wrongfully. Right? When you experience wrongful suffering, pain, situations, how does the Bible tell us uh, to respond? He says, respond with a mind or a conscience towards God. And he says, endure it. Enduring is another word for patience. And patience is a, a result of being in faith. He's talking about be, be, be in faith about it, be at rest about it, be at peace about it, because you are aware that God sees it. See, a lot of times we get involved in trying to fix our problem because we're not conscious of God. We're not aware that God is standing with us and he sees it and that he's going to fix it. The only thing we're conscious of is our ability. The only thing we're conscious of is how we're being affected by it. So we get busy trying to fix it, and God says, don't do that. When you're suffering something that's wrong or undeserved, endure it. Be at peace. Be patient. Why? Because God sees it. He'll fix it. Amen? Amen? The dream goes on and goes on. It says, then the person put out his hand like in a gesture to stop and blew on me. I was confused. Didn't understand what this meant. But suddenly I fell backwards into a hole and fell asleep. So, again, they're trying to take matters in their own hands. The person advises them to rest. Apparently they didn't. And what, what does this person do? Puts their hand out and then blows on them. They fall back into a hole where they go to sleep. What is, this, what is God saying to us in this dream? Well, what does it mean to be blown on? Well, if, if you read in John 20, we're not going to turn there, but in John 20, when Jesus rose from the dead, when he was resurrected, the Bible says he appeared to his disciples. And he says, he blew on them and said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. Hmm? Why didn't he just lay hands on them? when he was ministering the Holy Spirit? Well, I think it's for a couple of reasons. Number one, did you know that the word breath and spirit is the exact same word in the Greek? Hmm? Pneuma, breathe on them. Number two, the other reason why I believe he blew on them is because that's how the spirit was going to be manifested on the day of Pentecost. 
The Bible says the spirit came in like a rushing mighty wind. And he wanted them to put two and two together. The breath and the wind. Oh, this must be what Jesus meant. Right? But the point I want us to see here is that many times the scriptures compared being blown on or wind as an impartation of the spirit. So I believe this person blew on this person in order to give them the, the spirit of rest. And notice what it caused them to do. It caused them to go backwards and then fall into a hole where they fell asleep. Now, it doesn't make a lot of sense until we look at Isaiah. So let's turn to Isaiah 28. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Fall down backwards. The only time we, we, you know, we observe people falling down backwards from, from the wind or the spirit is when, you know, we're in a service where, you know, the spirit is being imparted and hands are being laid and, you know, so people fall out on the floor. So in, in those situations, falling back is almost like a good thing because it shows that this person has kind of received something from God. But what I'm about to show you in Isaiah is how falling backwards is not a positive, it's a negative. Amen. When you fall backwards, it's because you're being prevented from going forward or going in a direction you tried to go. God knocked you back, made you go backwards. And that's exactly what we see here in Isaiah 28. Look at Isaiah 28 and verse 12. Isaiah 28 and 12, to whom he says, this is the rest. Notice, he's talking about the rest. This is the rest <clears throat> wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. This is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. So stop right there. So what the prophet is saying here is God has sent them to give the children of Israel rest. But instead of them receiving this rest, what did they do? They rejected it. Right? And for weeks, God has been preaching to us faith, trust, relax. Even when you fall into different situations and circumstances, relax. God is doing this to refine you. But how many know, even though we receive this word coming forth from the man of God, many of us aren't receiving it. We're still going in the same direction we were going before the word came. Yeah, I won't make you raise your hand, but many of you here today, when you were sitting in the pew, God has been speaking to you and the Holy Ghost says, now that's you, you need to do this. But we leave this place and keep going in the direction we were going before the word came. And this is what Isaiah is dealing with. This is what he dealt with in his day. He, he's speaking to the people to get them to stop trying to fix it themselves, stop trying to do that. And he's told, he, he, he gave them advice to rest, but they wouldn't hear it. And what happened as a result? Verse 13. But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line. That's how you guys feel. It's part what? Oh, how many parts you got to this message, Pastor? <laughs> That's what they were saying about, uh, you know, Isaiah. It's just precept. Oh, no, here go another one, another one, another one. Precept upon precept, precept upon, line upon line. Hear a little what? Yeah. That they might go and fall what? Yeah. And be what? Not restored, broken, and snared, and so this time falling down backwards ain't setting them free. It ain't delivering them. It's not refreshing them. They're falling down backwards and falling into a captivity, snared. And the reason they're falling down backwards is because they're being hard-headed. It's like God is stopping them in their tracks. If I don't stop you, you're going to run shipwreck, so I'm going to knock you down. And what did, what did the person do when they got knocked down? They fell in a hole and fell asleep. Some of us, we are never going to rest until God knock us out. I'm going to give you a little background so you can better understand what's happening here. 
Isaiah is prophesying to Israel and he's inviting them to rest because what you may not understand is when Israel became a nation, when they went over into the promised land, God gave them a commandment that every seven years they were supposed to let the land, the ground rest meaning they were to go through that entire year, don't plant anything. Don't put down any seeds. And God says, if you do that, I will cause it to come forth by itself. And you'll still eat, but you won't have to do it. And why did he give them this commandment? So that they would learn not to trust in their sowing, in their work, so that they would learn not to put their trust in the gods of Canaan. Because the gods of they, the reason why the people in Canaan served gods is so that their crops could grow. Baal, the Baal god, they would offer up sacrifices to Baal because the ground in, in Israel was so bad that they felt like they needed divine help for it to grow. And so, that, so what, what God didn't want the children of Israel to do, he didn't want them adopting those false uh, uh, gods to try to help their ground to grow. He didn't want them to put their confidence in their own works. So he says, every seven years, I want you to rest and trust me to do it because this is going to be for your good. But guess what? Somebody say what? In all of their years, they never did it. Not one time. Not once. Not once did Israel let the land rest. So you know what God did? He caused a nation to come against them to take them captive and force the ground to rest because there was nobody remaining there to sow it. See? See, if you don't do what God tells you to do, he will force it upon you. If you won't rest, he will knock you out so you can't do anything. If you won't stop trusting in your money, he'll let that then lay you off. I lost all my amens. Oh, no, I don't receive that in Jesus name. Well, you don't have to receive it because what you just what you just said to me is you're just like them. You would not hear it. You're not listening. Oh, but you're going to listen when God gets done. So this is what Isaiah is dealing with. You know, they, they, they're being stubborn. And Isaiah said, that's all right. God's got something for you. He says, he's now going to bring a rest, but not in the way you think. He's going to force you. He's going to knock you down. You're going to go backwards. Hmm? Because you wouldn't look to God for help. And they went backwards. And Israel did go backwards because you know what they did? When when the nation that God sent against him, which was Assyria, when Assyria came against him, you know what the Israelites did? They went back and tried to recruit help from Egypt. How many know Egypt was where God brought them from? And guess what they did? They went back to the place that used to keep them captive and had them as a slave and knocked them upside the head and chased them down the street with a bat every week. Oh, that's what we do. After we get delivered, because we don't trust God, we start panicking, and we go back to the ones that used to beat us upside the head. Say, I'm going backwards. See, they went backwards. And guess what happened when they went back to Egypt? It didn't work. The Assyrians not only conquered the Israelites, they conquered the Egyptians too. So that God went into captivity with them. See, this is what's going to happen. You're about to get other people in trouble. Being hard-headed. And God says in this dream, you know what he says? He says, because you won't listen... Not only am I going to knock you back, I'm going to knock you into a deeper hole. A hole. Yeah. 
What does this hole represent? Now, let me, let me just share with you because some of you are not, you scared now. Don't relax. <laughs> the, the hole wasn't hell. It wasn't the pit. And the reason we know that from the dream is because when they fell into it, they didn't catch on fire. They didn't shatter into pieces. What did they do? James chapter 1. That's the purpose of God sending another hole in your life to put you asleep, not to destroy you. You're trying to kill me. You know, that's what we used to say. When we used to get spankings. You're killing me. You know? <laughs> how many? Yeah, we don't, we don't spank no more. I guess that's what. But how I many they used to spank? They used to spank. And when you were on the receiving end of one of them spankings, what was what you'd be like, you're trying to kill me. <laughs> no, I'm not trying to kill you. I'm trying to change you. <laughs> Amen. And how I many know God's not trying to kill you? And you know, there are a lot of people, a lot of Christians that, that don't believe God spanks. God's like this, like these millennial parents. They don't spank no more. God don't spank. Well, my Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, amen. James chapter 1, verse 2. Let's see if we can locate this whole. James 1 and 2. My brethren. So he's not talking about sinners. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into what? Divers. Those are holes. Fall into. That's what you fall into, right? You fall into a hole. But notice what he calls it. Temptations. And he, notice what he says. Don't get upset. Don't get worried. Count it joy. Be thankful when you fall in divers temptations. Why? Verse 3. Knowing this. See, you got to know something. See, conscience. You got to be conscious of something. You got to be aware of something. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith, so the hole or the temptation is to help you go to sleep. Trying your faith. Faith is like the posture of sleeping because you're not trusting in your works. You're resting in your works and trusting in God to do it. So the Every temptation, say with me, every temptation, every temptation is, intended is intended to teach us to, teach us to, sleep. to sleep. How to sleep. You know what happens many times when we fall into a hole, when we fall into trouble, when we fall into a temptation, a trial, or a test? We're so busy trying to get out instead of trying to learn how to rest in it. What does God want us to do in the holes? Rest. What are, we, what are we busy doing most of the time when we get in them? Yeah, there it is. You see the problem. See, this is the problem. See, this, this is why we stay down there. Instead of trying to climb out, what should you be trying to do? Yes. Because what's the temptation to teach you? Rest. Faith. Patience. What patience is, is resting through a trial until you get delivered. That's what patience is. It's the word endurance, to bear under a trial until it ends. Yeah. Trying to teach us to rest. And that's what the hole is for. Let's go back to the dream. Mm. When I awoke, it felt like I'd been drugged. I meditated on that for a long time. I was like, well, that's weird. That one had me stumped. This person said that when I, you know, I got knocked out, you know, because I'm, I'm hard-headed. But he knocked me out. I went into this hole, this pit, this trial, this test to teach me to rest. When I woke out of it, I felt like I had been drugged. I, I've been... I struggle with trying to put my finger on why this person was drugged or felt drugged. Part of me felt like, you know, this is sometimes the reason why, you know, we avoid trouble. We just try to drug ourselves. 
Yeah. Instead of trusting God, we just drug ourselves. Sometimes it's like a, a hangover. Or did God have a double meaning that, you know, instead of me going into the trial willingly, you know, he had to drag me into it. I couldn't figure it out. I believe God wants each individual to think about that. Because how many, t- how many know sometimes we run from trials and we find ways to escape them? That's still a work of the flesh. I says, not this time. I want you to trust God. I want you to trust me. Don't try to drug yourself out of it. Trust me for it. And sometimes we don't know, you know, when we are to take that advice. This is why it's always good. Say I'm listening. listening. It's always good to uh, 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 trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways. What? And to, why, where have we forgotten to say, Lord, what do you think about this? Should I take this or should I not take this? Should I go this way or should I not go this way? We just assume we know. But we never pause and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? And if you get it from God, how many know you can always feel good about that? Because here's what I know and what you should know about your God. He takes everybody through a path that's unique for them. He will never force you to go beyond your faith. The Bible says of Israel, when he brought them out of Egypt, he led them by easy stages, it says in a New Living Translation. He led them by easy stages. The Bible says he could have led them in another way that got them to the promised land faster, but he took a longer route. Why? Because they weren't ready for that. Because how many, but how many know Sometimes we keep claiming we're, we're not ready, but God says, no, you're ready. Yes? I said yes? That's why you can't always look to men and ask them what you need to do, because they don't know you like God does. They don't know what you're capable of. Because how many know sometimes the master will come to you and say, Yo, you're ready for this. I can't do it. Yes, you can. Come on, stand up. Yes. But here's what we know. If we follow his direction, we can always be in rest. You need to ask, should I do this, Pastor? Should I do that? Can you do it and be in rest? Can you do it because you believe you're doing this because God wants you to do it? I was talking to my son a little while ago, a couple days ago, actually. I guess I'll just let the cat out of the bag. Uh, my oldest son, Blake, is about to move away to Texas. He's relocating. Yeah, he's, he, he got a, a job in Texas. And um, he and I, he's been going through this process. And, w- and what, I, what I really love about my son is he didn't, he wasn't looking to take this job to get away from mom and dad to prove that he can be an adult or a man or anything like that. This was actually a, a, a time of, of great uh, a, a prayer for his life. He was telling the Lord, look, I'm fine where I am, and I'll, I'll do anything. Just, I just want to be in your will. And then he, you know, he was talking to the Lord about you know, giving him certain confirmations, and the Lord did. He showed him that this was it. And so he asked me what I thought about it. And so I told him, I said, babe, you know, it really doesn't matter because a lot of times when we see situations down there, we look at it in a natural. Well, what about this in a natural? Can, can you do this? And what? I said, no, don't even ask any of those questions. The only question you need to ask is, do you believe God is sending you? And if you believe he's sending you, who cares what's over there? Who cares if the job ever works out? Who cares because he may be sending you over there for something else? The question is, should I move? And only God can answer that. And what, this is what I'm saying is a lot of times we get so caught up in looking at all the details in a natural, should I do, who, you're looking at the wrong thing. The only question you need to be asking is, Lord, should I do this? And if I should do this, who cares about all the details or all the particulars? Because it doesn't matter. 
The only thing that matters is, am I in the will of God? And I think we, we ask the wrong questions. And we try to solve our issues through our logic. It doesn't need to make sense to your mind or to the mind of your family. It just needs to line up with the mind of God and the will of God. Are y'all out there? I feel like I'm losing you. Go back to the, to the dream here. He says, when I woke up, I felt like I'd been drugged. When I awoke, it felt like I was in a tunnel. Mm. Everything around me was a blur. And the only thing I could see was a bedroom door in front of me. Oh, the Lord is speaking. He is just so smart. So remember, this person fell into a hole. But when they woke up, guess what the hole had become? A tunnel. A tunnel that they could only see at the end of was a bedroom door. Now, let's handle this tunnel first. You know what a tunnel is? If you look the word tunnel up, it means an underground passageway. Oh, my God. An underground passageway. So when we fall into temptations, what should we be looking for? The passageway. This is what God gives. Everybody who falls into a trial or a test, there's always a tunnel down here. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Come on, it's a tunnel down here. It's a tunnel. I know you, you're, you're, the, the devil's trying to make you think this is it. This is it. This is it. You're going to die now. No, there's a tunnel. It's got to be a tunnel. Because with God, every hole has a tunnel. 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 Has a tunnel. Say that with me. Every hole that God puts me in has a tunnel. Has a way out has a passage. There's a passage down here. I love the movie National Treasure when they found themselves in that cavern, that hole. They, they, they were, the rest of them was panicking, but the one who was smart, he, you know, he was the one figuring out all the puzzles. He says, no, nah, whenever they build these holes, they always build a tunnel to get out. How I many know whenever God puts, builds a, tunnel, a, a hole for you, a trial for you, he always builds in a tunnel. Yeah, I'm going to show you. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I don't know why y'all don't like my little lesson here. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. There hath no temptation, say a hole. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to men. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with every hole, with every temptation, make a way to escape that you may be able to what? Oh, see, we, we skip that. We skip that. God makes a way out, but what does the way out include? You bearing it. Oh, I see. He gonna make a way out, but the way out is to sleep through it. Yeah, you got to sleep through it. <laughs> you got to sleep through it. See, notice that's why at the end of the tunnel was a what? Door. Uh, thank you, Summer. A bedroom door. And what are bedrooms? Places of rest. See, we don't want to. No, that's bed. I ain't looking for a bedroom. I'm looking for an exit door. No, there's no, no, so, no. We look for the exit. God says, don't look for the exit. Look for the bed. Because that's your way out. Where's the faith and how do I rest? Notice what happens next. And this is, um, this is our last one here. It says, later, I remember throwing myself to the floor from the bed. So they made it to the bed, but they threw themselves to the floor and I tried to crawl, but I couldn't move. Every time I tried to move, I couldn't. Because I couldn't move, I started praying prayers of protection, prayers that the devil would have no power over me, and prayers that I would not be afraid. 
when they made it to the bed, guess what they did? They got tired of laying there, and they threw themselves to the floor. Right? And that's exactly what happens whenever we get out of faith. We get to the, you're on the floor. You're not advancing. You're going down. Threw themselves to the floor. And what did they try to do there? They tried to crawl. I meditated on that. And you know what the Lord showed me? He's, you know what I, I, I um, associate crawling with? I associate crawling with someone who's trying to pray while at the same time do it themselves. Right? 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 Because what do we do? We, we get on our knees when we pray, right? But instead of just sitting there and pray, we try to crawl and pray. Yeah, you, we, we're really just trying to. <laughs> we want to get credit for praying, but we're really not praying. We're not trusting God. We're in the posture of prayer but we're trying to do it. And there are many people who are, looking, who are listening to me right now. You've been in a posture of prayer, uh, but you've been trying to do it yourself. You've been meeting with your squad. You've been meeting with your prayer partner. You get up in the morning and you pray, but when you get done praying, you end up doing what you want to do. That's crawling. That's crawling. You're trying to move. You're trying to fix it. You're trying to change it. Mm -mm. Stop crawling. I didn't say get off your knees. I said stop crawling. Stop trying to do it. Because this trial is not about you move, learning to move. This trial is about you learning to rest. Remember why you went into captivity. Because you've been trusting in yourself. Now, every trial isn't for that. I want you to listen to me. Every trial the Lord puts us in, it's not just to teach us not to trust in ourselves. Sometimes God's trying to develop other things about it. But I'm saying we're in a season right now, especially the people who are listening to me today, that we went a long time. And many of us have never learned to rest. Our whole life, we've been fixing stuff. Our whole life, we've been freedom fighters. Our whole life, we haven't been waiting on nobody. We'll, we've been doing it ourselves. And we've been big and bad enough to do it ourselves. But I'm saying to you today that God is bringing us into a trial. Well, it ain't going to work. Because the purpose of this trial is to deliver us from that leftover sediment that we brought from the old life. God helps the child that got his own. That is not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. It's not. It's not in the Bible. I know, I know we say it like, thus saith the Lord. God, you know, the, I was, yeah, I, think, I think it was Fred Sanford I was watching. He was like, you know, the Bible says God bless him. No, he didn't. No, it didn't, Fred. Fred, no. No, he didn't. No, he didn't say that. That doesn't come from the Bible. Amen? You know what God blesses? He blesses those that put their trust in him. And this is something that the church I'm talking about this present day church has never learned in all of our existence, which is why our taste is different. The taste that we have is different than the taste the church had years ago. Because this generation of Christians, believers, have not truly learned to trust God. Instead, we've learned to trust in our riches, and in our inventions. We've got so many inventions that God has become obsolete. And you see that? It's like every day man is trying to create a way that he no longer needs God. You know, we, we've almost come to a point where 
You know, like they're cloning people. So, you know, like, oh, you don't need God to put it together. We'll put it together in the laboratory. Oh, yeah. They're cloning. They're cloning uh, sheep, calves, and oh, yeah, cloning them all. Maybe you just had a, a tomato that they cloned. They cloned that one. You probably had some catfish that they cloned, cloned that one. Because they wanted it all to come out the same. Get the best price for it. Yeah. So, we, so what I'm saying is man is constantly inventing ways where we no longer have to trust God to do these things because we can do them ourselves. And we think that's an advancement. Oh, yeah, God, God wants us to do this. So we, no, you think God wants to uh, write himself out the equation? You, you, you think God's trying to, try, trying to uh, 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 get us to a point where we no longer need him? To work himself out of a job? No. Nah. And I'm telling you, uh, the saints, the church, and the world is headed to a hole. And maybe some of us are already in one. And that's because God is trying to Teach us to stop taking matters in our own hands. Stop being a freedom fighter. You know, we've lost confidence in the authorities. One of the most important authority is God. We no longer have confidence in the authorities in church, in society, and no longer have confidence in the authority of the scriptures the Lord himself. We're against all, we just think all authorities ain't helping us. So we we take matters in our hands and and I'm saying to us, God is, is trying to correct that. And this is the reason why many times we get in these situations. So I wanna, I'm advising you, I'm admonishing you, learn to rest. Learn to put your trust in God. Start asking God, Lord, what do you think about this? How how do you suggest I move forward? Don't just assume you know. And be content with just knowing I'm in the will of God, even if it doesn't make sense. Even if all the ducks aren't in a row. Even if all the T's aren't crossed and all the I's aren't dotted, the only thing I need to know is, Lord, are you saying this? Are you leading me to do this? And if that's the case, then be at rest. Be at peace because God is going to handle it. And, And do it knowing that all things are working together for the good of them that love God and are the call according to what? That's why you want to find his will, because everybody that's in his will, he says everything will work out for your good. It's working for your good. If if you are a person who who is insistent in making sure you're in the purpose and will of God, then God says, I will make sure that everything you encounter will work for your good. And when you know that, you can have rest and you can be. And, and that's what God wants. The, this is what we this is the value we add to society. It's teaching them how to trust God. Right. That's what the, the old grandmother and those people that we used to look at. That's what we went to them for uh, to teach us how to trust God. They used to sing the song. We, we come this far. How? By our ingenuity. And you know why they had to get here by faith? Because they had nothing and no one else to help them. Sometimes it's good to have nothing because you'll learn to trust God. We got the whole world trying to help us. And we left the one that can truly help us. And that's the Lord. Stand on your feet today. I want us to examine ourselves. I know many times we just stand after the word. But whenever I have you stand after the word, this is an opportunity to take what we've just received and make sure that it's sown on good ground. 
This is not just a time where, you know, we're just stretching because we've been sitting for a while. We're trying to make sure that we have created the kind of environment where the word that we just heard can take root and germinate. So I want everyone to bow your heads today and let us all examine our hearts. Believer, examine yourself. Have you tried to take matters in your hands? Are you trying to take matters in your hand? Have you been tempted to take matters in your hand? My advice to you today is to rest. Stop battling with life's problems. Stop trying to fix your situation. I didn't say stop wanting it fixed. Stop trying to fix it. Put it in the hands of God. Here's your chance right here, right here. He'll take it from you. I know you feel like, oh, no, he, he don't want it from you. Yes, he want it from you. If you give it to him, you put it in the hand of the master. He'll turn it. He'll turn it into a blessing. Come on, put it in the hands of the potter today. Whatever it is, what is it? Is it situations dealing with your body? Put it in the hands of the Lord. If it's situations dealing with your future, put it in the hands of the Lord. What about your calling, your vocation? What about relationships? Put it in the hands of the Lord. Say, Lord, fix this. Don't try to fix it. Call the authority. And dial 911. Who shall ever so call upon the name of the Lord? Call him up. Call him up. Call him. Don't run out there and try to stand in between your trouble. Call the Lord right now. Do it right now. Tell the Lord, Lord, you see this. I'm calling on you right now to fix and deal with this situation. And Lord, give me the assurance that you've taken it and that you're working it and you're bringing about a good solution. And Father, I pray that you would give a confirmation to us today and bring rest to our souls. Yes. That, that's going to tell us that you've got it under control. Bring rest to our soul. 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 He maketh me to lie down. He maketh me to lie down. Lord, make me lie down. Make me lie down. Make me lie down. Come on, believers, stop crawling and lie down. He's your shepherd. He is your shepherd. And so, Father, I pray now. I pray for those under the sound of my voice. I pray that their sins be forgiven, that they be remembered no more, and that you will respond to them as you responded to your only begotten Son, who said and testified, I thank you, Father. You always heareth my prayers. Father, I thank you today. For Christ's sake, you are hearing the prayers of your people. And Lord, you don't have to knock us into a hole. We know how to lay down. You don't have to knock us backwards. We know how to lay down. Lay down, lay down. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I thank you for a spirit of rest that's being ministered now to the hearers. You taking, a, taking away the anxiety. Oh, in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Oh, hallelujah. And in all your ways, acknowledge him. In all your ways. Stop making decision, believer. Acknowledge the Lord. Lord, what do you say here? And he will direct your paths. Do you believe that today? 
Give me what to say Let me hear you Clearly define What I am to do Let every word Penetrate the heart Let what is said Leave them running to your arms Use me alone Use me